Hello and welcome to the fourth part of Lesson 5. In this part of Lesson 5, we're going to obtain the expression for the angular velocity in the gap of the Couet cell using the Navier-Stokes equations. What we'll see is that this is another version of the moving wall problem. If you recall the flow on a vertical belt back in Lesson 4, you already have some insight into the form of the solution that we're likely to get. To obtain this solution, we're going to use cylindrical polar coordinates and make a similar set of assumptions as before, specifically that the flow is steady and unidirectional, which is to say that there is neither temporal nor spatial acceleration. Hopefully, what we'll see is that the answer we obtain from this solution route is the same as that obtained from the last part of this lesson. So, let's have a look how to do this, and the first thing I'm going to do on my blackboard is draw a diagram. There is a plan view of my Couette cell. It has a stationary outer cylinder, it has a rotating inner cylinder. The inner cylinder has a radius of little r i and an angular velocity of omega i. My outer cylinder has a radius of little r o. So, there are the Navier-Stokes equations, and remember the first thing we're going to do is to justify setting the substantive derivative to zero. And so in order to do that, we're going to closely examine our flow problem and see if we can make the assumption of neither spatial nor temporal acceleration. Now, we've already assumed that the flow is steady, which is good, so that eliminates the temporal acceleration. And if we look at the flow pattern we expect, we can see that we've got a theta direction rotation of my inner cylinder. And that's kind of like a moving wall problem. So I would expect my fluid flow to be following that rotation in the theta direction. And so, in effect, what I have again is a unidirectional flow, which infers that there is no spatial acceleration. So with neither spatial nor temporal acceleration, we can set the substantive derivative of velocity to zero. So that's our first step complete. Now, my coordinate system of choice is cylindrical. I'm going to measure radii from the center of the inner cylinder, and I'm going to measure circumferential movement in the theta direction. So I'm going to think quite carefully now about what velocity components I have and what pressure components I have. Let's start with velocity first. I have an angular velocity of my inner cylinder, in this case going counterclockwise in the theta direction. And I'm going to say, well, the only velocity I'm going to assume I've got is in the theta direction following that angular velocity. Moreover, since I know that the inner cylinder is rotational and the outer cylinder is stationary, I'm going to say V theta only varies as a function of radius through that gap. OK, so those are my velocity components. I'm going to neglect gravity because this is, in effect, another horizontal flow. I'm going to now think very carefully about pressure. So you'll see on my blackboard, I've drawn a dotted line at the center point of the gap all around that circumference. So imagine that you're a fluid element traveling along that dotted line. At any point, you wouldn't expect there to be a big jump in pressure. That would be unphysical. That would be driving a flow. And we don't expect there to be a discontinuity due to symmetry arguments. That means that there can be no pressure variation around that dotted line, which means that my theta direction pressure gradient is zero. There is no pressure gradient in the theta direction. Otherwise, you have a very unphysical discontinuity at some point. Now, let's think very carefully about my radial direction pressure gradient. Now, when we were discussing the Navier-Stokes equations and pressure gradients, we did say that if you've got streamlined curvature, there will exist a pressure gradient transverse, perpendicular to, that streamlined curvature. And so, actually, in this problem, we do have a very small radial direction pressure gradient, dp by dr, because of the nature of the curved streamlines. So, we're going to have to make an assumption here to neglect this. And the assumption that we're going to make is that, well, if the inner cylinder radius is quite large and the gap between the two cylinders, R0 minus Ri, is quite small, the curvature, as seen by the fluid, actually becomes pretty negligible. Yes, it's there, but 
at a first approximation, we could assume this to be a planar flow. It's not, but it's not, not a far off approximation. So using that logic, we're going to say, yes, a radial pressure gradient does exist. However, it's so small, it has no bearing on the problem. But that does highlight something very interesting, doesn't it? Because if we think of a different scenario, maybe where the inner cylinder hasn't got a particularly big radius, and maybe where the gap is quite large with respect to the inner cylinder radius, and maybe where the angular velocity is quite high, so we've got quite a high speed in that gap, maybe the streamlined curvature at that point does become significant. And if we think about what would happen if it were to become significant, it means that flow would be driven in a radial direction. And if we think about the classic instability that can happen in Couet cells, where we have Taylor vortices forming, that gives some insight into how a Taylor vortex can form, because we have this radial direction pressure gradient, which will drive flow in the radial direction, which means because you've got two solid boundaries, if you've got an outward flow in the radial direction, that fluid has to go somewhere where it hits that wall, and so you end up with a recirculation zone. And because there's a symmetry of the problem, you're going to end up with effectively a toroidal vortex. So we have to be rather careful with this problem, because the Navier-Stokes equations does tell us that there will be a radial direction flow. So, so long as our inner cylinder radius is large, so long as our gap is small, we could neglect that radial pressure gradient as being insignificant. But we have to think carefully and we have to knowingly justify why we can ignore those terms. So we've identified our key velocity direction, we've made some assumptions about pressure gradients, now we can drop a Navier-Stokes in vector form into our coordinate system. We've ignored the substantive derivative, so the left hand side is zero. We've correctly justified ignoring any pressure gradients now, so the grad p term is zero. Gravity body forces aren't a problem in this particular um, solution, so fg equals zero, so all that remains is whatever non-zero term of the Laplacian exists. And if we look at our direction of our velocity, it's the theta direction of velocity, varying as a function of r. In your notes, you have the Navier-Stokes equations expanded in cylindrical polar coordinates. So if you look at the theta direction and the radial velocity, the tangential velocity terms, how they vary with radius, you'll find that the only non-zero term we have is mu d by dr of 1 over r d by dr of rv theta. Okay, so that is the only term of the equation of motion that matters. Now all we have to do is to identify boundary conditions. So let's think what's happening at the surface of the inner cylinder. At the surface of the inner cylinder, at r equals little r i, we have an imposed angular velocity. So remembering that v equals r omega, my theta direction of velocity, v theta, is simply omega i r i, where omega i is the angular velocity of the inner cylinder. Fine, so that's that boundary condition. At the outer cylinder, again, fluid stuck to the wall. We've got a no-slip boundary condition, much as we have at the inner cylinder. However, the outer cylinder is stationary, so there is no tangential velocity, so v theta equals zero at r equals r zero. So we've got two no-slip boundary conditions, and we've got a wall-driven flow. So let's integrate and apply those boundary conditions. The integral of the left-hand side of this expression is simply the integral of zero with respect to dr, which just gives us constant c1. On the right-hand side, we're going to have the integral of d of 1 over r d by dr of r v theta. So everything inside that bracket is going to be the result of the integral. So when we integrate that up, we can see that we're left on the right-hand side with a 1 over r term pre-multiplying the remaining derivative. We're going to take that 1 over r term over to the left-hand side and multiply it by c1. And so c1r equals d by dr of r v theta is the remaining equation that we get after the first integration step. We're going to go straight into the second integration step now. Integrating the left-hand side, we get c1r squared over 2 plus an integration constant c2. And on the right-hand side, we have r v theta. 
OK, now is the time to explore our boundary conditions. So at the outer cylinder, at r equals r0, v theta equals 0. So the right hand side of the expression we've just derived is equal to 0. So c2, therefore, is minus c1 r0 squared over 2. OK, fine. So we can write c2 in terms of c1. Let's have a look at the boundary condition at the inner cylinder. So at r equals little r i, v theta, well, we know that's going to be omega i r i. It's the velocity in the tangential direction due to the angular velocity of the cylinder. So we know that the right hand side has r i squared omega i resulting from it. And the left hand side, we know we can write c1 and c2 as functions of each other. So we've actually written um, c2 as a function of c1. So we can write c1 over 2 ri squared minus ro squared, which is the combination of those two integration constants together, which allows us to evaluate c1, which we can write in terms of the inner radius, the outer radius, and the angular velocity of the inner cylinder. So now that we've evaluated our integration constants c1 and c2, we can finally write our velocity profile thus. On the left-hand side, we have a bunch of terms involving ri. On the right-hand side, we have r squared omega, so we're nearly there. So if we want to write omega as a function of r, we simply write this. Rearranging omega now is a bunch of terms involving ri and omega, i and r0, and no viscosity. So as before, the velocity profile does not depend on the viscosity of the system, because all we've got is a wall-driven flow. Now, the eagle-eyed amongst you will notice that the expression that we've just derived is not identical to the previous result in the last part of this lesson. So they're algebraically different. However, they are equivalent. If you to plot both out, you'll find that the plots overlay each other. So part of your homework is to convince yourself that these two solutions are the same. So let's recap some key points. In this part of this lesson, we solved the Navier-Stokes equations for Couette flow, and we used cylindrical coordinates to do it. We saw that reasoning around in the circumferential direction, there couldn't be a pressure gradient because the existence of any pressure gradient would result in a pressure discontinuity, which would break symmetry. We also reasoned in the radial direction that there can't be that there might be a pressure gradient because of streamlined curvature, but that we can neglect it because of the dimensions of the gap and the inner cylinder. But this flagged the key warning that if the dimensions of the inner cylinder and the gap were incorrectly chosen, we would have a significant radial direction pressure gradient, which would result in a far more complex flow field. So with the assumptions that we made, we saw that we've effectively got a cylindrical coordinate version of the moving wall problem. And the result is independent of viscosity. And I can assure you we did obtain the same result as a force balance approach. We've just got it in a slightly different algebraic form. And it's your homework or part of your homework to prove the equivalence of these two results.